We, we are honoring Ruth Bader Ginsburg today through action. And um, our first speaker day today is um, Rich Gorella with, uh, with um, Protect Our Vote Philly. <laughs> And um, we're going to just have Rich will tell us, um, he, is, he is one of the founders of Protect Our Vote Philly. Um, he lives in, and he's lived in South Philly for 15 years, a real Pennsylvanian, Senator Schumi. <laughs> um, and he, um, is, he has been the communications director for local campaigns, including Larry Krasner uh, for district attorney. So let's give a hand off, give a hand for Larry Krasner who made a point of saying he would prefer not to have Philadelphians kidnapped off of the streets by un, unmarked government goons, so thank you. Um, he's also worked on election inter integrity in Cambodia um, and for the democratic opposition in the U and in the US for, um, for a move on.org. So he understands how important election security is because he's done it in Cambodia and he's doing it here. So um, I'm going to stop introducing uh, uh, Rich and I'm just going to let Rich speak for himself. So let's all give a round of applause for Rich, however we do it. <laughs> And we're all shaking our hands in the uh, the uh, deaf in the deaf community. This is how you give a round of applause. So thank you, Rich. It's all you. Uh, thank you, and it's it's great to see all of you this morning. Uh, you can hear me, okay? Yeah, great. Um, so as as Vash mentioned, I'm from Protect Our Vote Philly, and we've been working for a couple of years now. Uh, really as a watchdog over the city commissioners who in Philadelphia make up the Board of Elections. Uh, we started off working on trying to fight off these overpriced and insecure voting machines that we're now saddled with. Um, and we still are going to try to get rid of those, but that's a little bit on the back burner right now because right now we're dealing with uh, November's elections. So I do want to mention that we are we are more of a policy and uh, policy advocacy group looking at the nuts and bolts of how elections run. We're less of a, you know, we don't do uh, voter turnout or registration. We don't do broad based voter education and engagement as important as those things are. We're trying to do uh, trying to do the research and trying to keep on top of what is happening locally with the Board of Elections, especially and how our elections are run so that all the votes that are cast in Philadelphia are cast fairly and so that they count. The thing that, and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of do a pretty short introduction of what we're focusing on now. And then I wanna open it up to questions because what I found is there's a, a lot of questions in people's minds right now. So I wanna leave a lot of time for that. Um, our main concern coming up for November is vulnerabilities. As probably most of you have heard, there's a huge amount of legal actions in progress and gearing up where the votes of Philadelphians are going to be under attack because Philadelphia is critical for the Pennsylvania outcome and the Pennsylvania outcome is critical for the national outcome. Philadelphia is ground zero for attacking the validity of votes because one side knows perfectly well that the vast majority of votes in Philadelphia are gonna be votes for the other side. So we're, we're a nonpartisan group, but the fact is that the, the threat comes from the Trump and GOP side. So we're gonna talk about that and, and, and say it. What, because we're focused on the board of elections, which is the city commissioners in Philadelphia, what we've been looking at and documenting for a while is unfortunately weaknesses that in their procedures that are creating vulnerabilities. And what we're worried about is that those vulnerabilities can be exploited in, in uh, November and after November. So without going into the, um, the nitty gritty details, which takes a while, and uh, I'll, I'll paste up a link to a document that does for those who want the nitty gritty details. Um, what it comes down to is that this Board of Elections has very few published procedures for anything that it does. It kind of goes hand in hand with the way that they don't post agendas or transcripts or even minutes of their public meetings. Uh, they don't publish procedures for the nuts and bolts of how they canvass the votes uh, that they get. 
and they don't have procedures for, for example, how members of the public or representatives of candidates and parties can watch and document that those procedures are being done correctly. And that we're afraid is going to open up vulnerabilities because when, you know, frankly, when you're carrying out this very complicated operation of running in effect two elections at once and counting the votes from that, everything's gotta be buttoned up very securely. And if you're kind of doing things by the seat of the pants, there's gonna be mistakes and errors and complaints that are made. And it's not just that there's a concern that the Trump GOP side would be actually able to disqualify votes. There's also a concern about the optics that they're gonna be able to go out in public if it turns out that Philadelphia is critical and say, you know, and sort of exaggerate and distort things that happened. And we want that opportunity to be as limited as possible. The election in Philadelphia should be documentably, provably rock solid in every way possible. And right now the commissioners are frankly failing in that regard as they have been failing for a while. So again, the, the areas that we're looking at are the procedures um, in collecting uh, mail-in ballots and counting them and canvassing them, also in canvassing and totaling up the ballots from in-person voting. They're also, we're concerned about the procedures with regard to how candidate and party watchers can help document that those things happen correctly. And uh, we're secondarily concerned about the board's own procedures in terms of the Sunshine Act and their transparency of their own operations, which they're in incredibly secretive about. And then the one probably main policy thing that we're concerned about right now that nobody else is, well, others are starting to talk about is a legislative question of whether votes, whether ballots will be allowed to be processed and prepared for counting before election day and whether votes will actually be able to be counted before election day. We're very much in favor of allowing counties to prepare ballots for counting before election day and get, get those ballots all lined up to be quickly counted. We're very much against any counting of votes that happens before election day because it's risky for election integrity and it's also uh, doesn't save that much time. So those are sort of the topics we're looking at, but we're following very closely all the different Supreme Court uh, rulings and the questions about different legislative questions that have been coming up lately. So um, I guess what I want to do is just open it up to questions. And uh, if you if you make your questions short, I'll make try to make my answers short so we can get through a lot of them. And uh, I see Sharon Strauss is here also. So she might be able to jump in on a couple of these too. So if anyone has any questions, they could be about, um, you know, mail security of mail-in voting versus in-person voting, uh, that, you know, anything like that that has been raised. So we got, we did get a note in the chat about whether the commissioners are aware of that. And yes, we have sent them an open letter. I'm finding the, address of that right now to put in the chat. Um, Rich, if you know it off the top of your head, you can say that, but I'll, I'll put it in the chat too. You're putting, uh, I'm sorry, you're putting what? That the open letter on on the, what the commissioner should do to uh, yeah. safeguard our election it better. Yeah, I just, I just put it in. Yeah, I, I see that somebody else said, uh, I'm, not, I'm not making you feel warm and fuzzy. Uh, I guess, <laughs> what can we do to ensure the election security? Um, there's a few things that you can do where, and I'll come back to this too. Um, you could, I think the big, the best pressure point right now is to call your city council member and ask them to lean on the commissioners to improve their procedures and sort of tighten up their procedures. Uh, another thing that you can do is find out how you can be, if you're, if you're not already volunteering as a poll worker, which I encourage you to do, 
Um, find out how you can volunteer as a watcher for a candidate or party that you like. And that means that you could go to the canvassing that happens, uh, I think it's gonna be mostly at the convention center this time, uh, where they're totaling up the votes so that you can watch and make sure things are done right, but also be available to counter false accusations that things were done wrong. So this is a, you know, elections are something where, where we need eyes on what happens. One, we want things done right, and then we want it to be seen to be done right. So you can help by being a watcher and, and seeing that. I'm also gonna add, there's, there's other things that you can do, such as um, photographing the poll tapes after the election. Um, there's a number of things that you can do on election day. Uh, again, we do need poll watchers, so that's great to do, but if you're not gonna be a poll watcher, um, there's many other things you can do. Um, I'm going to find a list of that too, unless Rich, you have something with a URL, because there's this is- uh, To be a, like a poll worker? Well, to, to do other elections, um, election day and post-election day help to kind of make sure that the counting and processing is on the up and up. Yeah, you can volunteer with um, electionprotection.net. Uh, right, right. Is it .net or .org? Um, is one of the... Uh, I'll have to look it up and try to paste it. But yeah, 866ourvote.org or electionprotection.org does a lot of that work. Right. Carolyn had a question. I did, thanks. Uh, so Rich and Sharon, um, uh, if you are if you are comfortable sharing what how are you voting not who are you voting for but um, how are you what is your voting plan and how I, I get asked all the time and I'm sure many of us on this call do people who um, say what's the best way to vote there are options now what should I do and I always say don't let perfection perfectionism get in the way of just voting but what do you tell people I tell people it's it's a it's a choice where they probably should weigh a couple of factors. As you said, number one, the most important thing is to vote one way or the other. Um, when the question is to vote by, by mail slash drop off versus in person, I think that for a lot of people, assuming that they have that choice because they can physically go to the, you know, go to the polls, a lot of that choice has to do with how they feel about protecting their health. The safest thing for your personal health is clearly don't don't be in a in a potentially crowded polling place. Um, it also protects other people's health to some degree to not go there because it'll be less crowded and fewer lines. And so even if you know, so it's your health and to some extent other people's health. On the other hand, it's also true that there's a fundamental difference between the mail-in slash drop-off method and voting in person. When you vote in person and you check in, you've been validated. And when you vote, that vote cannot be pulled back. It, it's going to count as much as any other vote. It's 100% in. When you vote by mail or by drop-off, some small percentage of those ballots are going to get rejected for one reason or another. And they could be that you made a mistake filling out the declaration, or that it somehow gets there too late. You can minimize those chances, of course, but they're going to validate your vote later at a future time. So you don't know 100% that your vote is in. So in terms of knowing that your vote will count, it's probably a little better in person, but in terms of your personal health, it's better to vote by mail. The thing that I'm personally going to do because I like to see with my own eyes every step, as many steps of this as I can. So what I'm going to do is apply for a by mail ballot and I'll receive it and I'll see when it came and what it looks like and all that stuff. And then what I'll probably do is bring that ballot to a, an in-person polling location, turn it back in to be voided so that I can actually vote. Uh, in person, but I'll have the option if I want of, if for some reason I decide no way I'm going in there, I'll still have the option of, of dropping it off. 
So if you want to kind of keep your options open, go ahead and apply for a mail-in ballot as soon as you can and recognize that um, you'll be able to drop it off uh, or go in person later. So I'm just going to add, I applied for a mail-in ballot because I have um, applied to be a poll worker because I know we need poll workers. And if you're going to be a poll worker anywhere outside your own precinct, um, you can't vote in person that day. But otherwise I would vote in person for the reasons that Rich suggested. But the fact that these, uh, that there will now be 17 ballot drop-off locations around the city oh, right. it really took a lot of pressure off right. in terms of mail-in ballots because you, as long as you can get to one of those, you don't so much have to worry about the, the whole the mail piece, you can, you can not have that one extra step to worry about. So yeah, I was gonna do that. Thank you for that. Frida? Frida, yeah, so every time I sign my name and I look at the signature and I think, what the hell did it look like eight years ago when I first registered in Pennsylvania? And maybe I, I, I did move, so I don't know if I registered again seven years ago, but you know, it's, it's, it's scary, that part. So I have applied for an absentee ballot and a mail-in ballot, a mail-in ballot. Um, I, I would prefer to vote, yeah. I, be, I, be, I would vote in my polling place, but because of the COVID, I'm not. Um, but but um, there's actually gonna be a march to the ballot box in Erie on October 3rd. So we're gonna have a, a thing, you know, everybody can, put their ballot in the drop box. We only have one at Great the White House. And, um, but if a person like me, if I was a little insecure about that, if I've already applied for early, uh, for a mail-in ballot, I can't do the in-person er, uh, early voting at the courthouse, can I? You can, you can bring the ballot that you receive in the mail to a ballot drop-off site if there are ballot drop-off sites where you are. More. Is well, that to the polling place on election day. Well, that's like, but see, that's what nobody has explained. What does that mean? Do I have to wait online? Do I have to go through the same process? Then I might as well just vote in person. Yeah, it's a different process. The, I mean, not, not all of these details have been completely worked out, but one thing that is clear is that the early, um, the, what I call the, the, what they call in Philadelphia satellite voting office, the satellite board of election offices. But, but Frida is an area. Yeah, we don't have Right, so, so I don't know, I don't know how the details there, but if they have that, it is not that you are voting there as if it was in person and they're checking you in and you're voting on a machine. It's really a place where you can um, pick up fill out and drop off a mail-in ballot. So, it's no better than using the drop box then. It's, it's I not, still have to have my signature verified. The signature issue is a separate thing. And there's been a, uh, the, the State Department just kind of resolved this about a week ago, it looks like. They said they confirmed that no ballot should be rejected because the signature doesn't look the same as the old signature. The purpose of the signature on the ballot declaration is just, it's just a signature where you're saying, yes, this is my ballot. The purpose of that is not for anyone to compare it. And so the State Department made clear, I think very few counties were actually even checking, matching signatures and rejecting ballots for that reason in the first place. Now the State Department's made it, not, made it clear a signature mismatch is not a valid reason to reject a ballot. If the signature is missing, that's a reason. But they're not to be looking at signatures saying, this one looks different from that one. I just want to also give a quick update on what's happening with the, the actual counting of the votes, because I observed the canvassing and the pre-canvassing of the primary, and there were like a zillion different little cubby holes in offices where things were going on. And there, each party was only allowed one observer. They have not 
they are not willing to move out of the courthouse. They've they've had they've acquired more rooms and more people, and they may take some walls down. One county council person, my, my county council person, and possibly at my suggestion said, well, then each party should be able to have as many observers as there are rooms. Mm -hmm. So that's at least an improvement over going to one, not going to one big place, but that's what's going to happen here. I imagine a lot of the smaller counties are, are going to continue to have that kind of problem. Yeah, I think what all that takes is it's what we do in Philadelphia. We do our best to pressure the commissioners to make it possible for the watchers to actually see what's happening in a meaningful way. That's election code makes it clear that that's the purpose of watchers. And if they have things happening in all different rooms and cubby holes and stuff, then that job's not getting done. I have a question. This is specific. I don't know if you can answer it or not, um, but I have a friend who is a poll worker in Pittsburgh. And um, what she what she had said was um, when she went in for her training, there is a possibility, even though the law says you turn in your ballot at your po polling place um, and they restore the ballot and then you can vote on the machine. Um, one issue is, and this is what I'm wondering about in Philadelphia, is your name still in the book with your polling place if you have applied for the in-person absentee? I mean, if yes. you've applied for the absentee ballot, so would can I still sign the book and vote? Your name, your name is still in the book, and it's printed in the book in such a way that the poll workers can see that you applied for a mail-in ballot, and that's how they know not to let you vote on the machine, unless you bring in your unvoted ballot to be voided and then they can let you vote on the machine. But for anyone that you talk to about this, tell them, bring the ballot, bring the secrecy envelope, bring the outer envelope, bring all the pieces. Don't just bring the ballot, just go ahead and bring all the pieces, they're not heavy. <laughs> yeah, I just wanna, if I may, um, hi, I'm, I'm Meg D with the uh, Pennsylvania Dems Voter Protection Team. I just wanted to emphasize Rich's point that if you do request a mail-in ballot and you want to uh, and you decide that you want to end, end up voting in person on election day, you absolutely need to bring not just the ballot, but the uh, additional envelopes that come in with them. I think it's easier to tell folks to just bring the whole package. You just need the ballot and the outer declaration envelope. Um, but if you don't bring both of those things, you'll have to vote on a provisional ballot. So we want to make sure people don't just bring the ballot, but that they also bring their declaration. Just bring it all. Just bring all the stuff they sent you exactly. and you're good. Exactly. Is it, is it an unmarked ballot or if you filled it out, but you changed your mind? You just have to I, don't hand think it, it. I don't think it matters because they're going to void it. Okay. I mean, I've never actually heard that question, but I'm, since they're going to void it, it doesn't really matter if it says something on it, I would think. Yeah. But I also just quickly want to reinforce what you said, which is if you have your ballot um, and your dog eats it, it gets lost, you haven't sent it in, don't give up. You can go and vote provisionally and they will check to make sure your ballot never come, your vote by mail ballot doesn't come in and then your vote will count. And just and to add to that, in fact, if 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 there's enough time, you can even contact them and get a new ballot sent to you because each ballot that they send out is individually barcoded. So they can void that ballot that your dog ate and send you a fresh ballot. Um, so that nobody can vote that other one. <laughs> I have another question about Philadelphia voting machines. Um, so these machines are awful. I was, I was, me and Fran, I believe I recognize immediately were protesting them um, that in my most recent memory. Um, one concern I have is that they're extremely hackable. Um, are these machines going to be connected to the internet? They are not, the, the, the machines themselves are not connected to the internet and they're not able to be connected to the internet. So that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, it is unfortunately also the case that the uh, computers on which the that program the cartridges for the machines and so forth 
uh, almost certainly have at times been connected to the internet. So there are vectors where that can mm. happen. And that's one of the reasons, many reasons that we, that we oppose those machines. Um, as I said, though, we're, you know, we're, we're forced to kind of put that issue on. Right. I just wondered, like, I know you had said you wouldn't have people photographing the, what, I guess the count, is that something that you're okay. advising that, that every polling, just so that there's like some sort of record. So if something doesn't match up, is there any way we can get some kind of record? Like, like, I think the last time I voted on the machine, I took a photo of what I had voted before I hit the vote button. Mm-hmm. Or when it, on the verification screen, whatever. Well, there's there's two stages where you could do that. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're going to vote on a machine, absolutely do take the time to look at that piece of paper and, and make sure that it says exactly what you believe that you've chosen uh, because you can spoil it and do it over. If it doesn't, please do take a picture of it so that you can document it. You can't prove which buttons you pressed but at least you'll have a certain amount of documentation. If you need to use your phone's flashlight or bring a little flashlight, it's a good idea because a lot of those booths are dark and it's almost impossible to read that, that piece of paper. And your eyeglasses are small. And your, yeah, and your reading glasses if you use them, absolutely. Um, so yeah, don't. It's, it's funny how we all have a tendency to forget that almost all of us have this fantastic documentation device in our pocket. (laughs) You can take a picture of that stuff if it's not working out. And whereas Sharon said, at the end of the day, um, if they still put up poll tapes, uh, it's it's sort of part of the election protection project, I believe, to try to collect photos of the poll tapes from outside of all the polling stations. I think it's it's maybe become a little less critical since that only accounts for half the votes now, but it's still a layer of, of protection that can be useful. Thank you. And um, before we have more questions, we actually do have another speaker who also has quite a lot of knowledge and information about voting in um, here in Pennsylvania. And I would like, I would like, I would like um, Meg D to actually have a chance to say something and answer some questions before we continue to pummel poor Rich with our statewide questions when he's mainly focused in Philadelphia. So um, with that said, um, I would like, I am very honored and delighted to uh, be able to introduce Meg D who is the um, regional voter protection director um, for Philadelphia. Well, (laughs) and also, um, I served with um, also was an organizer with the Obama 08 campaign and served the Obama administration and is doing had just has done a whole heck of a lot of work that I could read, read, read. But I think I would just be better if we just let Meg D like tell us about himself himself. Um, And then we can and just be extremely honored and delighted to have him speaking with us today. Um, And um, he has he will be able to answer even more questions and then we will continue to ask answer questions because the knowledge we get is the knowledge we can pass to our communities. Um, And it is critically important that we have answers because people come to us. I know people come to me and people come to us for these answers. So um, let's do this. All right, uh, Meg D, you are up. I am going to pin your video. Excellent. Thank you, everybody. Everybody give him a round of applause before we pin his video. (laughs) Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Vash, and everybody for for having me here. Um, It's really exciting and, and inspiring to see all the activism and just grassroots passion that you all bring um, to this state. Um, and hopefully to me will not be a senator for much longer. Um, so I uh, just to, to step back, I'm the regional voter protection director for the Biden Harris coordinated campaign in the Pennsylvania Democratic Party um, covering Philadelphia. Um, we are building, you know, the the most robust voter protection uh, team in the history of the state. And I think for many of the reasons that Rich discussed um, and that you all are aware of, that's, you know, voter protection and making sure every vote counts is, is going to be more important than ever uh, this year. Um, and obviously, Pennsylvania is just absolutely crucial to uh, beating Trump and electing Joe Biden. I think I saw something from 538 
a couple weeks ago that basically said if Biden wins Pennsylvania, there's an 85 percent chance he'll win the whole thing. And if Trump wins Pennsylvania, you know, more or less vice versa. So it really is an absolutely pivotal state. Um, and we need to make sure we do absolutely everything that we can uh, to protect the vote and, and make sure voters understand their options for voting. Voters go through the process in a timely um, and accurate manner um, and that their votes are ultimately counted at the end of the day. Um, and as I said, that's why we're really, you know, the campaign is making unprecedented um, investments in in voter protection, but um, we also need uh, your help. I'm not sure if I'm if I'm frozen or can you all hear me? We hear you, um, but you are appear to be visually frozen, but you were unfrozen again. So. Okay, great. I just <laughs> wanted to make sure. Great. Um, so as, as Rich touched on, uh, there's three ways to, to vote in in Pennsylvania this year. And as you all know, and I don't have to tell you all, um, with Act 77 last year, um, there are some obvious changes to uh, the way that you can, the ways that you can vote um, in PA. So first you can vote by mail. Um, and for the first time in a general election in Pennsylvania, every registered voter can vote by mail um, by uh, applying either online or via a paper form um, and to request their mail-in ballot. Um, they'll receive the ballot in the mail and then they can complete it and either return it in the mail or drop it off at their county elections office or at any satellite offices or drop boxes established by the county. One thing that's really, really important um, with voters who are voting by mail is that they have to use the secrecy envelope as it's called, that comes with the mail-in ballot package. So you'll get your ballot package. It'll include instructions. It'll include a return envelope that has a declaration on the outside of it. Um, and it'll also include a, a ballot envelope or a secrecy envelope as it's known. Voters must put their marked ballot into the secrecy envelope, seal that envelope, put that smaller envelope into the larger declaration envelope, complete the declaration, fill it out, and put it in the mail. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court um, recently held that secrecy envelopes are required. Some jurisdictions like Philadelphia in the primary had counted ballots even if they didn't have the secrecy envelope with whole, based on the view that I think is completely reasonable that um, the lack of a secrecy envelope really doesn't do anything to disqualify the ballot or suggest that there's anything improper about the ballot. Um, but the Pennsylvania Supreme Court recently held that uh, in their interpretation of the election code, um, the secrecy envelope is required and jurisdictions therefore uh, are uh, mandated at least for now, unless the legislature acts to uh, to um, discard mail-in ballots that do not include uh, a secrecy envelope. Um, so that's just one thing I wanted to flag because it's it's very important. I, I think I might have froze again for a minute, but um, bottom line summary, secrecy envelopes, secrecy envelopes, secrecy envelopes. Make sure, you know, if you all are talking to folks about completing mail-in ballots. That's something that um, is really just critical to emphasize because, you know, small numbers of people, even if it's 1%, 2% of people who forget to use the secrecy envelope, that can add up in a big way that ends up making a difference in this election. And we all know just how close Pennsylvania was in 2016. Um, so that's the first way to vote uh, by mail. Um, the second way to vote is early in person. Um, now there's there's gonna be some variety here, <laughs> if you will, um, across counties, as we all know, um, while the Department of State has oversight and provides guidance um, to counties in terms of election administration, uh, there are 67 county boards of elections um, and they all do things a little bit differently. Um, I can speak primarily to Philadelphia, but we can also be happy to put you in touch, put you all in touch with 
the regional directors um, in your, you know, wherever you are across the state, um, the, the voter protection director covering your, your, uh, your region, um, if you have particular questions about your county. Um, but beginning soon in, in, in Philadelphia, it'll be hopefully September 29th. Um, voters can go to their county board of elections office. So in Philly city hall, or there's also a spring garden location as well as any satellite offices that may be established by the county. Um, so in Philly, they uh, announced that they're uh, proposing, um, I think 15 additional satellite offices. Um, and we expect that to hopefully be approved at the next commissioner's meeting on Wednesday, tomorrow, I guess. Um, and you can, so you can show up and you can essentially vote by mail in person, I think is the best way to describe it. So you show up, you request your mail-in ballot on the spot. Department of State guidance says that the elections office is supposed to promptly provide the voters with that uh, with that ballot. Um, it'll be the same kind of ballot package, or at least it should be, as you get in the mail. So you complete it in the same way. You fill out the bubbles, you put it in the secrecy envelope, you put it in the larger declaration envelope, you complete the declaration, and then you hand it back in. Um, the offices have to provide obviously a private place for you to complete the ballot um and you know once you've completed it again you just turn it in you either hand it over to your elections officials or there will be actual boxes where you can drop it off so that's a brand new process um and you know we're obviously closely tracking developments in every county across the state to see how uh, they're going to approach that process. I think some counties are further along than others, but it is an option as well um, that we want people to be aware of. Um, I, I think for, for that option, if people are planning on doing that, it's probably worthwhile to tell them to call their county elections office in advance just to make sure um, that they're able to, to do that. Um, I think we expect Philadelphia, for instance, to be in good shape in that regard, just in terms of the announcement that we saw uh, late last week with the satellite offices, but other counties uh, may not have um, necessarily, you know, put a put as as an extensive process on the table as as Philadelphia. So just important to check with your local county uh, before going. And then, of course, people can vote on Election Day. Polls open from. 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, November 3rd. As you all know, if you're in line by eight, stay in line. <laughs> um, and uh, as long as you're in line by eight, you're allowed to vote, don't leave. Um, yeah, so those are the three ways to vote. And, you know, our, our message is, is, and our goal is, is to tell people to make their plan. Um, so we're not trying to, you know, I think Rich touched on some, some very fair and reasonable dynamics. I think from our perspective, you know, our our goal is to make sure that however voters choose to, to vote, um, that they're educated on how to do it uh, in a timely and proper manner so that their vote is counted. Um, and so our message is make your plan. If you're going to vote by mail, if you haven't requested a mail-in ballot, do it right away. Um, we don't like to talk about how <laughs> you can wait until X date to do this or Y date to do that. Um, if you can do something now, do it now. So if you can request your ballot now, do it now. If you get your ballot, fill it out right when you get it, put it in the mail right away or go drop it off at an office or a drop box, act quickly. Um, and you know, act, uh, you know, act appropriately depending on the method that you're voting. Um, I would like to touch briefly just on ways that you all could get involved um, in supporting our voter protection efforts if you're interested. As I mentioned, uh, this new voting early in person process is unprecedented in, in Pennsylvania. So we are uh, planning to have uh, monitors, uh, volunteer monitors um, at polling locate, or let me step back, at elections offices uh, during the vote early period, um, which, as I said, in Philadelphia, starting on September 29th, I think it's already started in Northampton County, but other places, the dates will vary. Um, but we just want to have people at these locations kind of analogous to, but not not 
not really um, as any anywhere near as formal to poll watchers on election day, but what we're calling vote early monitors to just be present at uh, county elections offices in various counties um, and in satellite offices uh, across the you know across the state that are that counties establish just to observe kind of how the vote early process is going you know making sure that if there are long lines or if there are uh, issues with how um, officials are uh, you know are uh, hand Oops. So it seems as though Meg D has frozen up for a moment. Is everybody else here? And make sure it runs. Okay, he's back. Meg, oh. if you, Meg D, if you could um just re go back about fifteen seconds of what you said because it was totally frozen. <laughs> sure. So yeah. So so as part of the um so we I think I was touching on the vote early monitor program that we're launching um and I I. I don't know what you heard, so I'll just kind of quickly try to summarize, but um, similar to kind of analogous to poll watchers on election day, but not um, not nearly as formal. We just want to have a presence at the vote, vote early locations across the state, whether they be actual established county elections offices or satellite offices, because this is a new process. Um, and so we want to see if there are things like long lines, if if, you know, voters are actually able to go in there and you know, request and receive and submit the, uh, the their mail-in ballots in a pretty efficient way, or if it's taking, you know, an hour per voter, we want to be aware of that. And so vote early monitors will really be our, our eyes and ears on the ground um, during the vote early period, which um, starts soon, depending on the location, uh, and will run through October 27th. Um, so that's one area that we'd love to have your help in. And it's something that um, you can help with, you know, starting uh, pretty soon. Um, we obviously need poll observers on, on election day. Um, unlike the primary, there are going to be uh, far more polling locations, which is a good thing. Um, so the consolidation, at least, you know, from what I understand in Philly, there will, should be 800 plus polling locations, which is comparable to the number in the pre-pandemic era. Um, so that's good for in terms of accessibility, but it means that we need to have a presence at those locations. Um, and I think you all familiar with what a poll watcher is, so I won't go into detail, but um, that's something that if you're not already committed to uh, being a poll worker or for observing for um, you know, a third party, perhaps we would love to have folks help as, as poll watchers, obviously depends on your comfort level because it involves being inside the polling location all day. So we understand that um, not everyone's comfortable with that, but it is a, an important role. Um, there's also the Canvas Observer role. Again, I, I won't bore you because that sounds like you all are very familiar with that process as well, but with the count of the mail-in ballots, which um, at the moment can't really start until election day um, and is a much more manual, obviously, process than and time extensive process because you've got to open up all the envelopes and, um, you know, s stick the ballots through the counting machines as opposed to the machine on election day, which just spits out a number basically, right? Um, so we need to have folks, especially attorneys, um, you know, monitoring and observing uh, that process in each county um, to make sure that, you know, Republicans or others are trying to disqualify ballots or if officials are um, mistakenly uh, dismissing ballots that were there to address that uh, and make sure that every eligible voter is has their vote counted whether you know if they, if, if they voted by mail um, and then finally uh, if you all are interested in phone banking to support our efforts um, we make phone calls every evening to reach out to volunteers who've signed up with us um, to ask them to commit to doing something more specific. Um, and they're, I, I find them to be enjoyable calls because you're generally reaching out to people who've already expressed an interest in the campaign. And so it's just a matter of turning that interest into concrete action, the kind of concrete action that you all are taking every day. So it's, um, it's, it's an exciting kind of, it's, it's, I find it more rewarding in some ways than kind of just calling voters at random and, 
you know, getting a lot of people who hang up on you. Um, it's, it's really kind of, I find it more exciting and, and expiring in some ways. Um, so I'm happy to drop a link into the chat if that would be okay with just how folks can sign up. Um, Please do. And yeah, and happy to circulate more detailed information as well if, if anyone would like. But thank you all for having me here and, and certainly happy to have any take any questions you may have. So everyone, that was a round of applause. And um, thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So I, I have one question. I just want to be sure. Do you need to fill in the ballot at the county office or the satellite office, or can you bring it in already filled out? That's a great question. So if you have requested your mail-in ballot already um, and you get that ballot in the mail, you can either return that. Have I frozen again? We hear you. Oh, hear okay. you. You're just frozen in sight. Okay. Yeah, fine. you all are frozen for me, but as long as you hear me. Um, sorry, it looks like I'm having internet issues today. I apologize. Um, so if you if you have your mail-in ballot already or if you get it in the mail, you can either you know complete and mail it back in or you can drop it off at your county elections office in every county. So you can go in person and drop it off. Now, I would call in advance. Some offices might still be closed because of COVID, um, but really they should be opening up uh, if they're not open already. Um, and if you, if you live in a county that has established secure drop boxes and or satellite office locations, you can also drop off your mail-in ballot, your completed ballot at any of those locations within your county. Um, now, if you haven't requested your ballot and you go to a county elections office or to a satellite office and you request the ballot, you're under no obligation to fill it out there, then and there and return it. It probably makes sense if you have time to just complete the process there, but you could also take it back and submit it in whatever method uh, is most convenient for you. Um, but since we're <laughs> urging people to act as quickly as they can, um, if you're already at the office, it may be more efficient to just fill it out on the spot, take your time, you'll have you know privacy to do so, or you should, uh, and, and hand it right back in then and there. Uh, I saw Sharon in the chat had a question, and I know you would put two URLs that we have put on the Facebook comments, um, but I don't know if either of those URLs are relevant to her question. So go ahead, Sharon. Are you? Those are just the sign up URLs. Sorry, I should have. Okay. Uh, you just you mentioned something about the ready vote ready monitor program earlier, and I was wondering if you have more information about that online. Yeah, absolutely. So I can, why don't I share a link actually to the first step to get involved with that is to sign up for a training. And I should have mentioned that, you know, we'll have trainings for all of these um, volunteer action activities that you can take. Uh, we're not just going to send people out to pull, observe, or to, to monitor the early vote process without any guidance. So uh, I'll drop a link in the chat to um, to get to sign up for a vote early monitor training. Um, the next training is on October 4th. Um, and I expect that we will be uh, adding additional training sessions in the near future. Thank you. Okay. Um, does anybody else have any questions for either of our speakers uh, that we have not yet covered? It has been it has been questions, 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 and I've been feeling really good and actually feel a lot more educated myself about how and w what we're doing because voting has there's been so much work on the part of certain folks to make voting as confusing as possible this year because uh, they prefer we didn't. So um, I found this to be extremely helpful um, and I. Yes, first, let's have another round of applause for this incredible amount of wonderful information that both of our speakers and um, and and Meg D kind of had a little of his thunder, his thunder stolen because he was rich, probably gave some of the same information. But um, but that was this has been incredibly helpful and it makes me so happy to be able to be a resource to people in my community and around me now that I actually know what the heck I'm doing. So. Thank you all. Thank you both. Thank you everybody who has had 
good yeah. information today. 